Conference to apprise you of government's efforts to combat COVID-19. Today with me are the Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, and the Attorney General, the Honorable Faris Salarawi. The Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, will provide an update on COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Minister Cox, and welcome to the Ministry of Health's briefing to my colleague, the Attorney General, the Honorable Faris Salarawi. Ladies and gentlemen, the update is as follows. I normally like to contextualize as to what is happening globally. As we speak, in the world, there are 2,206,676 2, cases of COVID-19 in over 200 countries and territories. The deaths to date, unfortunately, are 148,663 and 663. The recovery, those who have recovered, now stands at 558,440. So that's the global context. The other two statistics I would like to share with you, which I do from time to time, are the case load per million. When we first started giving you that, maybe about two weeks ago, the case load per million in any country was 104 cases per million uh, persons. Today, that has gone up by 220% to 283.1 cases per million population. That is a very frightening statistic. At that time, Trinidad and Tobago's case load per million was 64. The, how the global in, uh, and international community rates us now, we are now at 81 per million population. So while the rest of the world has gone up by 220%, we have gone up by 26.5%. And let me just add that these figures are compiled and submitted to international agencies by public officers of the highest repute. These are compiled by public officers of the highest repute. What is the local situation? To date, as of 10 a.m. this morning, the number of tests done stand at 1,298, of which 114 are positive. And when we take out the statistical anomaly of the cruise ship group, which is 52, it means we are dealing with 62 positive cases. Deaths to date, and we're so sorry about that, and our condolences go to the families, are eight, seven in Trinidad, one in Tobago. Our hospitalized patient count so far is 64. They are all in two facilities in Trinidad. We currently have no COVID positive person in hospital in Tobago. In Cora, we have 11. They are all stable. In Coover, we have 53. No one is in ICU. We have one in the high dependency unit, and that person is in fact stable. And 52 persons in Kuva are able to walk around. They are basically well. They are what the doctors call ambulatory. At San Grande, we have 22 persons, all again ambulatory, able to walk around fairly well, and low risk uh, persons. One yesterday was sent from San Grande back to uh, Coover for medical testing. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is a brief update of the global situation and the local situation. And may I just end by saying all these figures that we submit to all global agencies are compiled by public officers of the highest repu uh, repute and integrity. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. Thank you very much, Minister. Let's hear from the Attorney General, the Honorable Faris Salarawi, who will brief us on government's plan to release certain categories of prisoners and litigation relating to COVID-19. Good morning, Honorable Ministers. Good morning, Good morning to Trinidad and Tobago and to members of the media. I wish to um, express my sincere gratitude to all of you for tuning in for this morning's um, update and again, to salute all of our essential workers and people in general for continuing to do such a fine job. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I propose to address six matters in the round this morning. 
One concerning the promulgation last night of further regulations under the Public Health Ordinance. Two, to give you an update in relation to the prisons matter that we're treating with. Three, to do a quick tour of some of the COVID-related litigation issues that I've been managing as Attorney General. Four, to speak to you in relation to certain activities that we have across two essential services that I have interest in. One, of course, is the Attorney General's Office and Legal Affairs. And secondly, of course, is the work that we do with the Judiciary of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Fifth is to tell you a little bit about uh, the Parliament structures that we have in terms of further sittings um, relating to my office. And six, of course, is some of the MP-related issues as it falls from the Attorney General's portfolio. So let's get started. Um, issue number one, which is the promulgation of new regulations, is combined with issue number three, some of the litigation issues, because it's attempting to further clarify um, some of the parameters that people have uncertainty about. Um, I'm pleased to tell you that last night we published um, new regulations. Um, those regulations are the effectively the public health regulations number 10. It's a restatement of the previous regulations and also very importantly includes an express clarification on the law. Um, this regulation is now legal notice number 75. It was issued yesterday, 16th of April 2020. And in it, I wish to point out, for those of you who will retrieve copies of it, as I'm sure it's been dispatched to the media, etc., we're looking at regulation number eight. Regulation number eight, which is a new regulation, comes in and is a direct importation of an existing law. The existing law has been put into the regulations just for the purpose of clarity. The existing law that I'm referring to is the power and function of the uh, Chief of um, Chief, Medical Chief Medical Officer, forgive me, and the Minister of Health under the Public Health Regulations and under the Public Health Act, or ordinance as it's actually called. So the Public Health Ordinance in Section 105, 1A and B, specifically allows the Minister of Health via the Chief Medical Officer, etc., in the way you read that legislation, to restrain, segregate, and isolate persons who are affected by COVID-19 in this case, or persons who are likely to be affected. In other words, the Public Health Ordinance, Section 105, has a precise feature of law which allows for quarantine. I'm using that word in a very general sense in communicating with the public. These Public Health Ordinance laws run alongside the Quarantine Act. I say that the government took this approach by way of cabinet decision last night, specifically so as to assist the honorable courts in considering clarification that has come to um, the front um, in terms of litigation that has been brought into this COVID pandemic crisis. And I'll come to that when I expand on the fourth issue that I wish, sorry, the third issue of litigation, which I wish, wish to touch on during the course of today's uh, presentation. Let's get, therefore, to the other work at the Ministry of the Attorney General. The Attorney General's office is responsible for coordinating with 19 other bodies, including the judiciary, the industrial court, the tribunals, etc. And importantly, we have roughly about 1,950 employees. So we have a very large basin. We see a very large number of people across a number of areas, litigation, legislation, services including births, deaths, marriage, companies, filings, lands, etc. And in coordinating with one of our biggest stakeholders, the judiciary, we have been at work literally 24 hours a day. I can tell you that the end of work that has been managed also includes the issuance of all of the government loans, borrowings, transactions, all of the regulations, all of the legislation. And I'd like to press pause to express my profound gratitude to the very hard-working teams of public servants and of persons who are on contract across the relative agencies that are managed by the Attorney General for an exceptional 24-hour-a-day um, bit of work. This plugs into the prisons matter. You will recall that the Honorable Prime Minister unveiled to the population the work that the government was looking at in managing the COVID crisis. In looking at the COVID crisis, 
every bed matters. Every ventilator matters. And if a prisoner is afflicted with COVID, that prisoner is entitled to a bed in the same circumstances that an average citizen would be. So in managing the COVID crisis, in managing the pandemic, this is a dangerous infectious disease. We've seen deaths in Trinidad and Tobago and very high volumes outside of Trinidad and Tobago. Looking at bed management is critical. So that's the public interest. Competition for beds. The national security interest therefore flows into the prisons. And when we look at the prisons environment, I can tell you that as at the 2nd of April, when I last addressed you on the prison population, we have a total from that date, 3,959 inmates. Those persons in prison include people who are convicted and people who are on remand. Very importantly, remand means that you're not yet under a trial, you don't have a conviction yet, and you're awaiting your trial. Importantly in that figure, of that near 4,000 grouping, 1,115 persons are therefore murder and therefore not entitled to access bail. We announced to the public the taking of an action brought by the Attorney General. The Attorney General, in this instance, took the matter to court so that we could have one court sit with considering a broad range of persons and looked at the issue of who was appropriate for release in two circumstances. One, where you are awaiting trial, you have been granted bail, but you cannot access bail quite essentially and simply put because you're too poor to access bail. A court has granted you bail, but you cannot access bail because you've not met the conditions of bail. The second category, of course, is people who are convicted. People who are convicted may have appealed and therefore be entitled to the right for consideration of bail, or they may be serving sentences and coming to the end of their sentence and also importantly, they may be there for very minor offenses for which the President of the Public may consider granting mercy via the pardons route under the Constitution. I can tell you that our action included bringing all of the relevant players to the court. And we brought the Commission of Prisons, the Registrar of the Supreme Court, the Commission of Police. We brought the Children's Authority. Um, to the court as named parties. That allowed us to ask the court to consider eight simple categories of persons for whom we could consider release out of prison. Number one, there is the very strict requirement that these persons cannot be in the category of offenses, serious offenses, such as offenses against the person. Secondly, dangerous drugs, kidnapping, trafficking in persons, rape, offenses against children, s all sexual offenses of a particularly um, heavy type, anti-terrorism, firearms, etc. So there's that general caveat. That group of persons falling in those serious offenses would not be in the consideration of the exercise of whether you can come out of prison or not. And I'm very pleased to say that we were docketed before the Honorable Madam Justice Lisa Ram Sumer Hines. Uh, permit me to say that we have had several appearances in court so far. We have had appearances on the 2nd of April, 5th of April, 8th, 11th, 13th, and 16th, that is up to yesterday. And we have also sat on Saturdays and Sundays, um, including public holidays. In these sittings, we have all appeared before the court by way of the virtual appearances I would like to thank the judiciary and all participants for such a seamless exercise. We were yesterday at the judiciary point able to include the public into the telecommunications and video linkages. linkages. That was always on the cards. That was not brought about as a result of any threat of litigation. It was just simply making sure the technology was up and that we would not crash the system because those court appearances are recorded in the judicial system as we must have with all video conferences. So I wish to thank the judiciary for that. In these several appearances before the court, we looked at eight categories. Category one, persons convicted of summary offenses. For that, we discovered 84 people. 
Category 2, persons convicted summarily of indictable offenses. We found 62 people in that category. Category 3, persons convicted of indictable offenses. We found one person in that category. Category 4, children convicted of summary and indictable offenses. We found 33 children. Category 5, persons charged with summary offenses but unable to access bail. We found 137 of those people. Category 6, children charged with summary and indictable offenses, including those who were convicted but granted bail pending appeal, they all being unable to access bail. We found 16. Category 7, persons serving terms of imprisonment in default of payment of maintenance fines. We found 44 people in that category. As a result of a, an application brought to our attention by the Honorable DPP, I'd like to say that a new category 8 was added by way of an amendment to the court order. That category 8 is persons who are convicted of summary offenses or persons convicted summarily of indictable offenses who have been sentenced to terms of imprisonment exceeding one year, but where the exception is that you're now into your final year of term and we are looking at that category this morning we are obliged to file that number at court via the commissioner of prisons and i can tell you now it's 459 people who are in that category in other words there are 459 people with less than 12 months left on their term of imprisonment for summary offenses or it's an indictable offense which was managed summarily. In other words, then we're not looking at the indictable offenses or serious offenses route. That gives us, ladies and gentlemen, if you combine all of the numbers, including the new Category 8, 957 persons. I'm able to tell you now that we, as a result of bringing this application to the front, we're invoking three areas of management. Number one, it's the entirely separate consideration by a judge for access to bail. In other words, then, a judge sitting in court will consider bail. For that category, we're looking at um, roughly 153 people. The judge also has the ability to consider um, persons who are convicted but on appeal, and, and that number includes that. For the people who are convicted, we're going for a second form of management. The convicted persons have the right to access the Mercy Committee under Section 87 of the Constitution. You're entitled to apply to Her Excellency the President via the Minister of National Security sitting together with the Mercy Committee. And recommendations can be made depending upon a holistic view of the entire circumstances, uh, including the victim's point of view and the recommendations coming from the prisons and the DPP and probation officers, et cetera, et cetera, um, psychologists and all of the areas that are involved there, the president can have a recommendation made to her by the Mercy Committee. And we're looking in that category of roughly 224 people. The third category is something which exists under the prison's rules. The prison's rules section 285 and 285A allow for the commission of prisons to put people into um, a review process depending upon all of the circumstances of their cases the recommendations coming from the prison service they can be released on an early date i'm very pleased to tell you that since we started this exercise 121 persons have in fact already been released out of the prisons these are low risk prisoners who have been monitored over the entire course of their um, incarceration, and they have been lawfully discharged out of prison via the Commission of Prisons utilization of this power under the Prisons Rules and Prisons Act. We also have something which is quite historic, and I wish to underscore this. In the courts, 95% of prosecution is carried out by the Trinidad and Tobago police prosecutors. 5% of prosecutions are managed by the DPP's office. Obviously, the most serious matters are managed by the DPP's office. In this particular case, the Honorable DPP and his team of, of officers 
have come into forefront management, and I wish to publicly compliment the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, because we have taken all of the matters, including those that are normally managed by the police, into the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, and that allows another form of consideration. That is the power that the DPP exclusively has under Section 90 of the Constitution to stop prosecutions. It's called a nolly pros in short form, nolly prosecute. And the DPP is therefore now properly seated, not only to appear in court on the bail applications, all of them, whether handled by the police previously or not, but also to consider whether there will be a stoppage of prosecutions, again, for persons that fit the category of being very low risk and proper consideration. There is also another very important feature that I wish to give public attention to. The Office of the Attorney General, as you know, we have been pushing very significant reforms over the last five years. One of the reforms is obviously to the criminal justice system, but we did this by virtue of a formula, plant and machinery, people, processes, and then the law. It's with that in mind that we expanded the number of courts, expanded the number of judiciary um, officers, the number of people assisting judges. We created divisions of court. We created a number of structures. We improved the number of masters from two headed up to 25. You all know the story of the extent of reforms. In that structure, we also, in process management, created a an historical uh, milestone. That is creating the office of the public defender. The public defender's office has been operationalized. The chief public defender is Ms. Hassin Sheikh. Ms. Hassin Sheikh has been appearing in court. She made history in launching the public defender's office into this prison's matter. The public defender and the office of the DPP are now carrying out the rest of the exercise of bail considerations before Madam Justice Lisa Ramsumer Hines and other courts that will consider bail. But this Public Defender's Office, which is an initiative of the Attorney General's Office, is very unique. That is to allow people who do not have their counsel of choice the opportunity to have competent counsel. In other words then, if your attorney is not available or you cannot access an attorney at law, the Public Defender's Office will represent you in court. So now we have a DPP's office and a public defender's office. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is quite simply an historic evolution of our judicial system in Trinidad and Tobago. The matter of bail applications is now properly set in the courts. The public defender and the DPP's office will take these several hundred matters forward. We have put them under judicial management again brought about as a result of the reforms that the government has led we we created as you're well aware the criminal division we allowed for the merger of the magistracy with the high court in other words then a high court judge can sit in the criminal division we have created masters of court etc and we have also allowed trinidad and tobago to see the full operation of our court pay system our payments into and out of court legislation, our plea bargaining legislation, our judicial management structures, and very importantly, through the Rules Committee, which the AG and other members sit on, led by the Honorable Chief Justice, we have now put in practice directions and rules that allow for full virtual courts. Permit me at this opportunity to tell you that's not all. We have, in fact, taken Trinidad and Tobago to a very important uh, milestone. We will have by next week 12 virtual courts. We already have virtual courts up and running. We have six of them up and running. We have in the 12 number, in addition to the six that we have right now, next week we will have 12. We will have four virtual courts at Golden Grove, four at MSP, one at the ECRC, one at women's prisons, one at Frederick Street, and one at YTRC. That is the Child Rehabilitation Center. That takes us to 12. That means, ladies and gentlemen, that we stop transporting the vast majority of prisoners, which cost the taxpayers approximately $80 million a year in prisoner transport. 
This is a huge milestone for Trinidad and Tobago. It's something that we have been working on for the last four to five years. I'm extremely pleased, and I wish to pay, again, a public commendation to the Honorable Chief Justice and Team Judiciary, as we call them, for ensuring that we did this in the most cost-effective uh, measure. I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it involves simply containerized solutions. We've taken containers and converted them into courtrooms, and that has resulted in all of these virtual <coughs> hearings. We're able there to deal with maximum sentence indications. We're able to deal with judge alone trials, bail hearings, remand appearances, and charge matters. This is added to by the operationalization of technology in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. In the police service, we're also engaged in virtual hearings. So that is another important milestone for Trinidad and Tobago to observe as all of our online facilities have come to fruition. Again, this has been brought about by a dedicated operation of judicial and process reform, which the Attorney General's Office has led in terms of the legislative and operational side, and which the various elements, Team Judiciary, Team TTPS, Team Prisons, they have all been participants in this unveiling of very uh, significant reforms in this country. It's um, quite interesting that this situation of COVID in Trinidad and Tobago has really just put a spotlight on what was a well thought out plan for the last four years. Permit me, ladies and gentlemen, to turn to the issue of litigation. Litigation, ladies and gentlemen, has, of course, emerged. There is a right to challenge anything, including the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. The courts are the forum for the ventilation of issues and the consideration of all of persons' rights. The government has taken a very careful approach in the balance of the national interest, the public health, the methodology of saving lives, but at the very same time, we have balanced through a progression of warming the waters or making the laws more serious. We have taken a progressive approach, and therefore the individual rights are obviously in balance with the national rights. Most regrettably, but entirely constitutionally, um, persons have approached the court. Unfortunately, it appears that um, the representatives uh, are only opposition members, in particular Mr. Anand Ram Logan and Mr. Gerald Ramdeen. Um, they have approached the court in a number of matters, and I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that they have been occupying a significant amount of resource and time. Judicial resource, attorneys general, uh, attorney general's offices resources, DPP's resources, counsel's resources. And in these matters, for instance, Mr. Ramdeen, as he's entitled to do on behalf of his client, um, approached the court to consider the reopening of a liquor mart. I can tell you that that matter um, was unfortunately not in his favor. Um, it managed to stay closed, again, because the regulations were in effect to put into effect what everybody knew, that is that liquor marts are closed. Another matter brought by Mr. Ramdeen involved um, a, a popular TV show host. Um, unfortunately, a matter came to the court. That matter was withdrawn yesterday by Mr. Ramdeen, um, really because he accepted that his client had tested positive for covid in fact, when we reviewed the audio tapes of interviews by Mr. Ramdeen and by his client, there was an admission that they already knew that even before they went to court. That notwithstanding, I can tell you we've spent umpteen hours and a lot of taxpaying dollars and resources in hearing those matters. So those are two matters that have gone um, courtesy Mr. Ramdeen. There are several other matters that have been brought by Mr. Ramdeen. Um, those, in fact, will continue during the course of today. My own opinion is that they are likely to fail um, equally as, as, as the first couple have, but nonetheless, I make no criticism uh, of the person's ability to go to the courts. That's their constitutional right. I'm just bringing you up to date that we have been extremely busy, uh, involved in public holiday, weekend hearings, etc. Mr. Ram Logan has been equally busy uh, on behalf of political activists in this country. And those matters are also before the courts. Many of them are in just pre-action dance. Um, I wish to apologize that 
it's been a very hectic load and I've not been able to respond to every matter um, because obviously, as Attorney General, I still have the other work to do. The VAT bonds, the loans and transactions, uh, making sure that the money is inside of the system for the thousands of people who are waiting for relief. The Honorable Minister of Finance reported yesterday some 38,000 people waiting for monies. That has a process which the Attorney General's office is completely involved in as every loan transaction and every bond and every regulation must pass under my hand. Um, together with my colleagues, the Honorable Prime Minister, the Minister of National Security, Minister of Health, there is constant work. So I regret that there is a, how should I say, that there has been so much activity in court which most respectfully I believe to be frivolous and in fact in one instance quite dangerously a subversion of confidence. And let me treat with that one. Now that the matter is finished, that is the matter involving the talk show host, I can tell you that there was a very dangerous slant brought to that equation where the credibility of CAFA testing was brought into issue. Contrary to blogging and activity on certain web pages, I want to state that Senior Counsel Mr. Reginald Armour made it very clear to the Honorable Court yesterday that it was a dangerous exercise of subversion of the confidence in the CAFA testing. The CAFA testing has never proved to be wrong. In that particular case, there was a simple transcription or human error point, which is normal, which is why the protocol is that the final discharge of patients is not complete until the physical document is received by persons who are in the process of considering discharge. There is confidence in the system managed by CAFA. For us to try and subvert the confidence inside of that is dangerous not only for Trinidad and Tobago and the psyche of our population, but for the entire Caribbean because CAFA does the testing for the Caribbean. So I just want to underscore that most regrettably, the approach of seeking to impugn the, the quality and, and, and consistency of reports from CAFA is to be rejected out of hand, and the government stands by the maintenance under the chief medical officer of a very rigorous system of testing and management. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to turn to the fourth item now, which is the judiciary's work. Um, the Honorable Chief Justice is arranging for the judiciary to go into a session with the public next week. But I'd just like to tell you, we have been extremely active in ensuring that processes continue without hindrance. Obviously, we have the 12 courts that I've reported by next week we will have, um, and those are the virtual courts. But very importantly, um, they work alongside the Trinidad and Tobago police system. I want to remind that we have electronic filing. We have electronic filing across the system. We're broadening it across the Attorney General system and, of course, Works and Transport and other areas. But at the judiciary, we have full electronic system. The webinar held with the Chief Justice and Law Association, there were over 400 participants in that webinar where the education has gone in. Um, we are making sure that maintenance, that is, the receipt of vital issue of maintenance is managed in a careful way. We are in the process of converting cash payments into electronic payments. There are many people who have their sole existence underwritten or supported by maintenance from persons ordered to pay. In that system, it's important to note that we have moved via the judiciary's innovation existing maintenance orders into electronic orders. The last aspect of the system is to try and migrate the cash payments into electronic payments, and that's an exercise that the judiciary is going to speak to. And again, I wish to compliment Team Judiciary for the innovation of ruling out all of the systems that we are seeing going ahead. The last thing that I'd say is, sorry, the second to last thing that I'd say is in reference to some very critical work that we intend to ask the Parliament to consider, and for that, the Leader of Government Business in both houses, that is the Honorable Camille robinson Regis and Mr. Franklin Kahn, they will speak to the Parliament agenda specifically. But as Attorney General, there is an urgent uh, miscellaneous provisions bill that I'm asking the Cabinet to consider. 
which will do some further adjustments um, to this COVID issue. Number one is to treat with the issue of statutory periods of limitation. Number two is to treat with electronic evidence. Number three, very importantly, is to treat with how cases move ahead, in particular criminal trials, including complex fraud. Number four, very importantly, is to consider some of the amendments to remove backlog and structures, some time-sensitive matters, for instance, the filing of certain documents, which we didn't catch in the first round of amendments that we did. That is under the Companies Act, statements of charges, etc. So we intend to go to the Parliament with those matters. Very importantly, again, the Ministry of National Security has been hard at work in operationalizing the electronic monitoring system. We have a bill that is in the Parliament. The Attorney General's Office drafted this legislation uh, in conjunction with the judiciary and other areas. We've spent a considerable amount of time getting that right, and the Honorable Minister of National Security will pilot the legislation drafted for him um, in Parliament, and that will allow us to bring to life the electronic monitoring. That is materially important to everyone in two areas. Number one, it's connected to how we manage prisoners who may be released out of the system. And number two, very importantly, it's also connected to the issue of domestic violence. As Attorney General, I have drafted a very robust set of amendments to the Domestic Violence Act. I'm awaiting the stakeholder feedback. I'd encourage the stakeholders to hurry up and send me the comments because I'd like to take that to the Parliament floor. And in that, we're allowing emergency applications for domestic violence to be managed, and very importantly, in the electronic monitoring side, to use corresponding bracelets and anklets. In other words, you may have a protection order. The person who has the benefit of the order, we're proposing to give a device which would warn you if the person against whom the order is made is in proximity to you. That will be managed by obviously an electronic system. There's a team of people that the Minister of National Security has put into place for this. It's going to be ruled out in an initial and then a further stage. And I want to compliment the national security team, the judiciary team, and the attorney general's team for keeping that on track. As you know, that amendment was laid prior to the COVID pandemic, but it is equally important that we get that up and running. The last area is to just simply say that apart from all of the national duties, in particular as an MP and an MP for San Fernando West, our office has been open, as has each office of every one of our colleagues, um, certainly in the government side. I'm, I'm told there may be a few MPs in the opposition who are abroad. I'm not quite sure. Um, I don't know the status of their offices for sure. But I just want to remind the population that our offices are open. In my own constituency, we have seen thousands of people for relief as we continue to manage the delivery of government services and charitable services through the individual MPs' offices. In attending at the offices, please, I encourage that we maintain the social distancing. I'm very pleased that of the 38,000 um, applications for government relief, for the pandemic relief that has come about there, 94% of them were done online. I want to assure you that the online versions are working extremely well and that we are there as MPs, each and every one of us, including our opposition MPs, to serve the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So I've given you a whole lot. Uh, on, I know it's, 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 it's a very short space of time to rule all of this out. I just want to assure you that we are purchasing the reward of a significant amount of work that we as a government put into place for over the last four to five years. All of these things have come to the fore not because of the pandemic, but because we took the laws, passed the laws, created the structures, operationalized all of these things over the last four to five years. Um, a little bit of trivia, the chief public defender is in fact someone who has served as an opposition senator in this very parliament. In other words then, there isn't politics in this dance. I'd like to end before taking questions by letting you know, I respectfully believe that whilst we all have individual rights, whilst we all have access to clarity of those rights into the court system, I respectfully believe that we need to think two and three times 
as to how anxious we are to move the court and expend resources when we can simply treat with it, if not on a bipartisan basis, but by way of clarification through a process. I really want to encourage Trinidad and Tobago to remember that our national um, colors are for all of us. This is a move which we must all take together. As Attorney General, I am acutely aware of the balance of rights between the public interest and the individual rights. I'd like to remind you that this is a particularly fluid situation. We don't pretend to be perfect. We will have errors along the way. We welcome all suggestions coming from all quarters of Trinidad and Tobago as we move to get this right in the constant changing environment of people, processes, law, and most importantly, public health, because all of these measures are designed quite simply to save lives. I look forward to your questions um, and perhaps can give some better clarification for things that I may have not done justice to in this rather long presentation on my part. Thank you very much, Honorable Attorney General. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll move right to the questions. The floor is now open. Remember to identify yourself and the media house you represent before posing your question. We want to give as many of you an opportunity to pose questions to us, but that means in our limited time, we will have to give each media house a chance to get a maximum of two questions in. And once we have completed the pool and time allows, I will come back to you. Let us keep this in mind as we begin taking your questions. 98.1 FM. We are not hearing. Ninety-eight point one. Okay, we would we would uh, get back to ninety-eight point one. I would like to move the new source. Hi, good morning to the panel. Good morning. Um, good, morning. good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I've got two questions here for the Attorney General. Um, Mr. Attorney General, if you can clarify for us the distinction between the DPP's office and the Public Defender's office, so that I'm clear on what their respective duty, what distinguishes them, what makes them different from each other. And with respect to the restorative justice um, uh, action being taken by the state at this point in time, prisoners are essentially going to be released into an economy that has for the most part um, ground to uh, halt as a result of um, COVID-19 um, sanctions and regulations. So what sort of, re of support systems might be in place for um, persons, being, persons who are likely to be released? I thank you for those questions. Um, the DPP's office is, of course, a constitutional office created uh, under Section 90 of the Constitution. So the Director of Public Prosecutions has the role and function of managing criminal prosecutions with three powers being vested into the DPP. One, the power to commence prosecutions. Two, the power to take over prosecutions. And three, the power to end prosecutions. That's a very clearly defined and well-articulated process. The public defender is an innovation of the government. It's a division of the legal aid authority. The legal aid authority only operated so far. What we found in the management of criminal cases, whilst we looked at plant and machinery, people, processes, and law. Even if we move the judicial number to 64, as we have, if we move the number of masters from 2 to 25, which, which we're doing, if we move the number of courts from 10 to 64, which, as you know, we're doing, if we put in rules of court, we put in all of the things that we have done, you still end up with the problem of approximately only 20 lawyers controlling the private bar. In other words, then, everybody may be ready for the trial, except the accused, because the accused attorney is not available, has a conflict, another matter, etc. In this particular structure, you have to remember the volume of cases. We have roughly 26,000 preliminary inquiries a year. We have a backlog of significant numbers of, of, of close to 100,000 cases, etc. Whilst we remove that backlog and structures, it was very important for the government to say, if your counsel of choice i.e. your own lawyer is not available, we will provide you with a lawyer who is a competent counsel. In other words then, counsel of choice versus competent counsel. That public defender's division 
came about as an exercise that I took very early in 2015. I went to the United Kingdom, met with the Public Defenders Division in the United Kingdom and the DPP of the United Kingdom, structured a model process, and then we adopted as a cabinet a non-legislative solution in creating the Chief Public Defender and Public Defenders Division. We've rented their accommodation. It's at Stanmore Avenue. We are in the process of building it out. We've had a little COVID pause at that for a moment, but we're a couple of weeks away from completing that structure. And effectively, this results in a full um, reformation, uh, a new form of legal aid advice and authority, where you have a chief public defender managing 30-odd lawyers, specifically tasked, where the court says your counsel of choice is not available, here is your lawyer available for you, who is a competent counsel who will manage your affairs. They are effectively polar opposites. The DPP is the prosecutor and the public defender is the defender. So they are on different sides of the equation, but they are both paid for by the state. This works in a number of countries, the United Kingdom, the United States, etc., etc. Relative to your second question, the process of release of prisoners in the three categories that we're looking at, prisons rules, pardons via the president, or by bail hearings. All of them involve an assessment by the judiciary, the president, or the commissioner of prisons as to the social circumstances of the persons to be released. Obviously, this is a very important question. There is not the intention at all or the risk being created of just releasing people into the wild to go and fend for themselves without a meal, without a home, without structures. There's a very careful approach where the exercise of discretion factors in the circumstances that people find themselves going into upon release. I will take, of course, the conversation a little bit further. We're looking at whether there should be a financial support engaged in this in the small interim position, but that's a discussion we're going to have with the Minister of Finance as we get the clarity from the courts and the clarity from the Mercy Committee. Okay, Minister. AG, finish? Yeah. Answered all the questions? Yes, I hope so. Okay, we go to we go back to ninety eight point one. Yes, good morning, uh, Stephen Cummings, ninety eight point one. Morning, FM. morning. A question for the uh, two questions ra rather for the Attorney General. Um, AG, opposition members of Parliament have been claiming being left out of having a deeper collaborative uh, approach in terms of you know legislative matters as it relates to COVID nineteen. Um, can you respond on that point? And secondly. Um, what is the status of IDC detainees in the current uh, environment of COVID-19? Um, is the IDC under the same uh, policy arrangement as with other uh, prisoners within the, the wider uh, prisoner system? Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Cummings, and good morning to you, sir. Um, opposition members of Parliament have been saying that they wish collaborative methods. Um, I don't think that the evidence stands up to that because what we've got from the opposition members is active litigation on matters that I respectfully believe ought not to even be in the court process. Mr. Ramdeen and Mr. Ramlogan alone have occupied a significant amount of activity in the courts and all of their matters have effectively failed. Um, I, I don't want to prejudge matters that are coming and that are due today, but I respectfully believe that that's not the case. We cannot as you are well aware, get the opposition support on the interception of communication bill. That is a critical aspect of COVID-19. In that particular structure, the Senate has passed it. All of the independents agreed with it. The opposition does not want to support it. They refuse to support the bail amendments to treat with firearms. They have said to the country, um, let's have a state of emergency, mm -hmm. but then they're going to fight to open a liquor mart Correct. They have said to the population, let's manage COVID appropriately, but then they're fighting to release people who are confirmed as having COVID and still are being affected by the disease. So I've seen some of the commentary saying that, look, the government ought not to touch on political matters. But as Attorney General, I'm going to speak to you factually. What they say and what they do are at polar opposites of the equation. I can tell you we received quite a number of suggestions from colleagues opposite 
A number of colleagues have spoken to me. Mr. Ramada has spoken to me. A number of my other colleagues have spoken to me. And all suggestions have come into the mix. And I thank them for the progressive approach in those instances. But the frontline politicians um, on the opposition bench don't seem to be walking the talk, quite simply put. Um, if they were, we'd have a very easy passage to all of these things. I want to remind you, the payment into and out of court, they opposed, as far as I recall. The criminal division, they violently opposed. That criminal division, um, in the process of their opposition and what they had to say in, in Parliament, the, their debates, had we not done the criminal division, we would not be in the position today to be having Madam Justice Ramsumer Hines, etc., pay by electronic means and all of these things. They gave a scathing attack on a number of initiatives that the judiciary took. The Chief Justice fell into significant odium as a result of attacks in the Parliament coming out of there. All of those things, the purchase of software, the operationalization, are methods that, unfortunately, the opposition has not supported. With respect to your second question, which is the IDC, that's the Immigration Detention Center, that falls under the Honorable Minister of National Security. I can tell you he is very busy right now um, undergoing that regime. That does not fall into court. People are in there for breach of the Immigration Act. And in treating with the Immigration Act, the Honorable Minister has a number of powers available to him, orders of supervision, et cetera, et cetera. But again, the social management of that has to happen. If you order someone into release by an order of supervision, you have to know where they're going to be, how they're going to be managed, and sometimes we're also looking at the issue of repatriation of citizens. Obviously, that's a very complicated issue when the world has shut down flying. Thank you very much. We go to CLC. Uh, good morning. Morning. Good morning. Um, Yolan Thomas from Caribbean Lifestyles Communications. This question is for the AG. With respect to the prisoners that were released, you said 121. I know initially you had said 388 in total. Had the increase of 957, does that include that? Or is it a new, you know, in terms of categories that you explained? Thank you. Um, yes, I, I clearly did a bit of injustice in, in rushing through the numbers. You're perfectly correct. Thanks for the opportunity to clarify. The gross number of 957 has included in it the 121 persons released via the Commission of Prisons Power to consider early release under Section 285 and 285A of the Prisons Rules in conjunction with the Prisons Act. The number has jumped significantly because of the addition of a new Category 8, which is now about to go into the court. That's the number of 459. So without that Category 8, the number would have been 498, including the 121 persons released. The 459 comes about because the Honorable DPP made a recommendation to the, to the team, to the Attorney General's team. Approached, we had direct discussions, and we asked the court to consider the DPP's position that we should be looking also at summary and indictable matters that are tried summarily and persons who are in the last year of their term uh, of, of sentence into this category. And today, it's now about to be filed in court, but I have the information, obviously, in managing the litigation. That number is 459 people who have been sentenced to more than one year, summary matters or indictable matters that are tried summarily, in other words, they're, they're less serious matters, and people who have a matter of months to run into the system. So. This has allowed us a very significant area of operation. Again, I want to caution, there are a couple filters in this. One, um, the scheduled offenses of serious offenses are not being considered. Rape, uh, anti-gang, all of those things, firearms, etc. And two, we're looking at the position of the exercise of judicial, presidential, and commission of prisons position to make sure that all of the circumstances are being considered, all of the antecedents, the other matters that people might have on charge. This is not a simple exercise of do you tick the box. All of the circumstances are being managed in this, in this, in this situation. So we're taking care to make sure to get it right. Unfortunately, we have the benefit of 
the DPP himself being involved in these matters, and of course, the Chief Public Defender and the Public Defender's Division. Thank you. ACP News. Hi. Hi. Good morning, Prime Bihari, ACP News. Good morning. I have, Good morning. I have, I have one, one question each for the AG and for the Minister of Health. Um, I'm going to AG first. AG, um, as the advisor of the Cabinet, is there any thoughts on having a sitting of Parliament now, seeing that a lot of laws are being made and um, there, there isn't really any sort of scrutiny except, you know, at press conferences when we, the media, you know, but we find that we too are constrained and uh, Matt did send um, a release recently, you know, about these issues. So I just wanted to find out if um, there might be uh, any thoughts to have a parliamentary sitting, you know, um, to, to deal with these issues and for the Minister of Health. There are some instances, reports that elderly people are dying um, at, at certain hospitals, at public hospitals, and they are being, and the relatives are being told that these people um, contracted COVID, but no autopsies are being performed and no testing was done. Um, and so people are saying, therefore, that the figures of deaths via COVID-19 may, may not be um, a true reflection of what is happening. Can you just clarify that and the procedure if someone is suspected to have COVID-19 who is not in the COVID-19 quarantine system? Sure. I don't know. What's happening here? Thank you for your question, Mr. Bihari. Um, perhaps um, you tuned in a little bit late, or maybe I wasn't as clear as possible. Um, issue number five that I came to treat with was specifically Parliament. And I indicated that there is a miscellaneous provisions bill that we intend to bring to Parliament. I've also indicated that um, there are there is the matter of the electronic monitoring, which we intend to move into Parliament. And I specifically said that the leader of government business in both houses, Mr. Khan and Mrs. Robinson Regis, would give the date by which we intend to do that. And yes, it will be in this pandemic period. So Parliament is intended to be moved. Um, the respective leaders of houses will arrange those matters, but we do intend to get back to Parliament because we have a significant amount <coughs> of work to be done. Permit me to say, um, th there was a, there's an important issue to clarify in what you said. You said that a lot of laws are being made and there's no scrutiny. Yes, that's, that's, that's not the case. We are making laws under the public health regulations pursuant to a law which allows us to do it this way. The Public Health Ordinance, Chapter 12, Number 4, is an act of Parliament born in 1915. Section 105 of that act allows the Chief Medical Officer, the Minister of Health, to make regulations pursuant to the management need for an infectious disease or a dangerous infectious disease. COVID-19 was declared by Her Excellency the President at the end of January to be a dangerous infectious disease, and we are well within the law of making these regulations. In fact, these regulations are published and the subject of um, media conferences almost on a daily basis, and as you're well aware, they've actually found themselves into the courtroom not a single matter of concern has been raised in the courtroom as to the bona fides or constitutionality of these laws. So we did, we did not need, nor do we need at all, to be in Parliament to make these regulations. I just want to make it absolutely clear that this is a perfectly lawful and constitutional measure which we have brought into the situation. And I'd like you to, to note that Trinidad's position in relation to the law has been unique. We have not declared a state of emergency, but we have, in because in that, of course, there are a huge trade-off of rights. You're going to suspend constitutional rights, and that's a very dangerous thing to do in too quick a time unless it is absolutely necessary. It is the Honorable Prime Minister who has kept to this course of saying, let's take a measured approach. As the advisor to Cabinet on matters of law, I obviously considered the Disaster Measures Act and the Public Health Ordinance, and the Public Health Ordinance meets all of the criteria for management that we consider best and appropriate to take a very measured approach in considering individual rights versus the public right and national good. Okay, so let me take part two of the question. Let me further elucidate and um, possibly repeat what the Chief Medical Officer said yesterday at the press conference at the Prime Minister's office. 
because the same question was posed clearly to the chief medical officer. Chief medical officer said, to the best of his knowledge and the data that he has, he has seen no increase in unexplained deaths due to any viral illness, whether it's um, H1N1, influenza B, or any other viral illness. He is on the record as stating that. Yesterday, he is also on the record as stating, as far as he knows up to yesterday, there is no data that shows an increase or any significant increase in severe acute respiratory illness, SARI, um, which is normally one of the things you look for. He has stated publicly he has seen no increase in deaths due to pneumonias. Um, so that lends further clarity to what is already in the public record by the chief medical officer. I hope that clarifies the issue, Mr. Uh, Bihari. Thank you very much. You know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we normally finish at 11, but we would, I have asked TDT for some extra time. So we'll take another question at this time. CNC3. Hi. Hello, good morning. Good morning. morning. Hi, morning, Head Table. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Minister Dial Singh, uh, two questions to you. I'll ask my first now, and when you answer, I'll ask the second one, okay? Sure. So, Minister, according to the CMO in a sworn affidavit to the court yesterday, the Trinidad Public Health Lab has suspended its electronic platform following an admission that there was an error in entering uh, the results of a patient. Now, TPHL falls under your ministry. In light of its suspension and given that the TPHL communicates results to the lab managers who then communicate that to the doctors, how will results be communicated in the interim? And are you concerned that similar human errors may have occurred and which may warrant a review of this process? Um, respectfully, I'll take that question, um, seeing that I settled the affidavit for the chief medical officer. This was what I was referring to as the subversion of confidence. The platform... Sorry, I'm seeing your head shake violently, Akash. Yeah. Do you want to say something? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. No, you yeah, go ahead not, and he will open. answer. Ask this okay. next question. Okay. Perhaps I should give the answer first, yeah. and then you can well, re-enter. Well, sir, before we, before we go there, it, it's not a question of, about... I understand, and Mr. Amor made it very clear yesterday, it's not an indictment on CAFA. I'm asking now that in the sworn affidavits from the CMO that they're saying that TPHL has suspended... It's, it's process of the electronic platform, mm -hmm. what happens in the interim? So what sure. makes up for that sure, while sure. it's suspended? I, I, I was in the context of explaining that. Certainly, I didn't intend to attribute um, the, the subversion to you, Akash. That, that was not it. I was saying that the persons who went to court, that is the, the UNC attorneys that were at court, politicians both, um, it, it was that subversion that we were speaking to in court yesterday, and Mr. Armour put that on the record. So... Human error is a part and parcel of every process. Transcription errors happen around the world. We were involved in the use of technology in this environment really to aid in the quickness of management. So what happened was the online TPHL facility was available for everybody to see across the electronic platform. So it's in the lab, it's at CAFA, it's in the centers, etc. That allowed us to have a real-time analysis as to what's going on. The strict protocol, however, is that you're not in a confirmed position until the manual hard copy hits you. And that's exactly what happened in the case that went to court and why we said that it was premature and ill-advised that they had gone to court because even by their own admission, made on the radio, made in Facebook posts, etc., they said they were told negative and then told positive. So they knew, but they still went to court. So because of the activity taken by the opposition in challenging the use of technology, which would have assisted everybody's benefit, so that we'd have a real-time understanding to be prepared. Look, you can prepare discharge papers, but await the final copy, etc. We've had to close that down temporarily to relook at the system. So we're entirely manual right now. This is a gift purchased by the United National Congress for the benefit of the people of Trinidad and Tobago as they engage themselves in COVID solutions. The protocol was always there, that you could read it online, but it's not perfected until the hard copy reaches you. 
So unfortunately, we've had to adjust the system to try and treat with an unfortunate challenge, and hopefully we'll get uh, a different form of technology. You just can't fix human error. Human error is part and parcel of certain things. But the system is robust. There is no final discharge until you receive the hard copy. You have a follow-up so question? Yeah, so, so just uh, so in the interim, it's going to be done manually while correct. we look at the system. Just want to get that correct, okay? Yes, sir. Okay, and the second question to Minister Dial Singh, and I'm sorry to bring this up in this forum, but I really need to understand your thinking here before I, I could possibly go forward here. Minister Dial Singh, I saw last evening on your, on your Facebook profile that you advised a member of the public to mute the television when it's time for reporters to ask their questions. Now, this after the gentleman asked if he had to listen to us asking irrelevant, dotish, and vexing questions. What did you What did you mean by that, Minister? Well, first of all, my Facebook profile was hacked. I never posted that myself. My Facebook profile has been hacked several times in the past two years. If you look at the history of my postings on my Facebook profile, I always stay away from these things, and most of my postings are what I do in the constituency. So I will never, ever make a post that is derogatory to the media or you or anyone else. So I have to look again that my Facebook profile, once again, has been hacked. In the same way, a well-known personality took a Ministry of Health um, um, page um, letterhead and under that banner posted something on Facebook. There is so much there is so much um, unwelcome activity on Facebook that we have to manage that. Um, so I give you the assurance, Mr. Samaru, it is not my intention to make that kind of post. I did not make it, and I hope you accept that in the spirit in which it was given. Could, could I just intervene quite unusually into this? Mm -hmm. I'd just like to remind um, everyone, we, we all have multiple tasks to do and in particular in the case of the Minister of Health and certain entities that have to operate. I mean the AG's office is no different, the office of the Prime Minister, especially national security. We're, we're juggling a whole lot all at once. So thank you for bringing it to our attention as to whether these things appear or not. There is a lot of sabotage that happens on the online platform. A lot of news that is put out that is misleading. I use that term loosely in inverted commas news. So thanks for bringing it to our attention, but we're literally working almost 24 hours a day. Thank you. Wire 868. Hi. Good morning. Lasana Live with Wire 868. Good morning, Lasana. Good morning. Um, two weeks ago, the Ministry of Health showed a, shared a very useful graphic which showed a contact tracing for 10 uh, or 50 COVID-19 cases. Uh, how many patients has the government um, complete this contact tracing for since then uh, and when might we have an updated graphic that that's one question mm -hmm. the other would be for the the cost of the virtual uh, ports uh, including the installation of the technology in the, in the police stations uh, and just some explanation in terms of um you know those the use of the police stations right um, obviously, it, it, it's important eventually. I don't know if because of the economic considerations now, if it's something we all want to do right now or later when the economy is stronger. So just something on those two, two more questions. Sure. So I will take the first part of the question, which was posed to health. So of the roughly 114 um, cases, if you remember, 52 of those cases, we quite, um, we quite luckily isolated at Balandra. It means they were never able to mix with the general population. So contact tracing was not needed for those 52. And that is the beauty of doing isolation and quarantine. You don't get that community spread. You don't get that community spread. And I heard one UNC person on TV last night saying, well, Andrew Como isolates at home. Why don't we do that here? Do you know his wife is now COVID positive? And that's a danger in doing home quarantine. So if you take out this 52, you are then left with 62 persons who are known positives. And as per protocol, you will contact trace all your primary contacts, secondary contacts, and all known contacts. 
the actual number I will not have with me now. And to answer your second part of the question for the mark, it is our intention to bring Dr. Avery Hines once again, at least once a week. We have had the map up twice or three times now. So that map will be back up next week, maybe Monday or Tuesday, to further show the population where we are as far as contact tracing is concerned and how the GIS map is operating throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll, I'll thank you for the question. Um, you asked about the cost of the courts at the uh, prisons, the virtual courts that we put in, and then you also asked about the TTPS coordination with it. I hope I've got it right in the answer that I'm about to give you. We spend 80 million TT dollars a year in prisoner transport to and from the courts. 80 million dollars on average, anywhere between 60 to 80 million dollars. I want to tell you that the innovation of the judiciary and in particular the executive court administrator, Master Christian Morris Allen, has come to significantly save this country money. The containers were purchased for a matter of a couple thousand dollars. And then we entered into the retrofitting of them. I couldn't give you the cost of that, but I can tell you that they were very modest costs in relation to that. The cabinet approved immediately the IT structures to hire the personnel, etc., to do it. And we're busy afoot at creating these 12 courts across the system, as I've identified. So whatever it is, it's significant, but it's a legacy um, entity because we're going to use it continuously. The intention was always to create these courts in the position. Because we had to stop the physical construction of the video remand center, we went for the containerized solution because we could faster rule that out. But they are going to be permanent features of the system as we broaden this out. Really and truly, the intention is to have the judiciary operate on a continuous real-time basis. When you see the amendments that we're doing to the Domestic Violence Act, you see that we're looking at emergency applications in a police station being granted by a judge. So we're really trying to push the area of innovation as it comes to judicial process. The TTPS, similarly, you'll recall that Minister Young, um, at very early in our tenure, reported to the population on the use of the video recording suites. They had unfortunately been purchased but never operationalized in the time prior to this government. Uh, we went on a mission to look for those video recording suites so we could capture evidence appropriately. Um, and importantly, now putting in the um, video facilities at the, at the police stations is where we can actually hear charge matters and other things remotely. So I'm very, 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 very happy about the innovation. Again, I want to remind you that none of this came about now. <laughs> this started years ago, and the Parliament's record will demonstrate that because they're all features born from legislation that we passed or things that we've operationalized. Tobago Channel 5. Hi, good morning um, to the panel. Morning. Uh, morning. My questions are for the AG. Um, can I get a disaggregation of the figures of the prisoners for Tobago? How many are currently in the prison system and how many are going to be released under this new provision? As well as um, for the virtual courts, are there any going to be available in Tobago? And also, um, would the public have access to these courts in the same way, you know, they could come and sit in the gallery of the physical courts and view court matters as they proceed? Um, thanks. Uh, so, yes, of course, I want to remind you that this is the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And um, we've paid a lot of attention. Let me remind you, we opened the new DPP's office in Tobago before we did it in, in Trinidad. That's being built out in Trinidad on Park Street and in San Fernando at Gulf City. Um, so Tobago is always foremost in our minds. We opened the Family and Children Division and Family Court in Tobago before even in my own constituency of San Fernando, which we have on deck as well. So Tobago is always a priority for the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Yes, we will have the VC facilities in Tobago. That's part and parcel of the system in the days and weeks ahead. Secondly, regrettably, I don't have the numbers for Tobago prisoners. I'll undertake to get those numbers and in the public release that we do in the hours ahead of us, I'll make sure to address those issues. So forgive me for not having that answer off the cuff right now. Express. Good morning, Camille Hunt Express. Hi, good morning. Um, 
I just have one question for the AG, Mr. Al Rawi. Um, referring to the letter to the attorneys representing the talk show host, um, is it normal practice for a letter written by the AG's office to allude to the political affiliations of the person being addressed? Wow, <laughs> thanks. So I wrote the letter and settled the letter. It's not the habit of the Attorney General to, um, to, to sign off on letters, particularly when we're going to go into court, etc. So that letter was squarely written by me, and you'll notice in the first and last paragraphs that I was at pains to protect the officer who I asked to push that letter forward by saying that this was done under the specific um, direction of the Attorney General. So I take ownership of, of that letter and its contents. And yes, I'd like to say that, look, Politics is part of the equation. A government is politically appointed. Hopefully you've noticed that we are at pains to try and avoid certain things. But in particular, the reference to the line which said uh, it, it surely cannot be lost upon the average observer that both persons, the attorney and the entity, the, the talk show host, have been sitting, uh, have been active politicians for the opposition. That was done as a matter of record on purpose because associated with that that letter set out a few things number one your action is premature number two you know that you're positive why are you testing this position number three you could wait on the pre-action process to actually go to work where you engage in um, sorting out an issue and moving the court only on final emergency basis in this case here two active politicians for the opposition went to court in the face of that letter, in the face of knowing that there was a positive test, and why that was said in the letter was to allow for an application for wasted costs. Let me explain to you what that is. Under the rules of court, you're permitted to ask an attorney at law who has wasted the court's time to actually pay the costs personally. And therefore, in settling that letter, I was laying it at Mr. Ramdeen's feet that if he persisted in this course of action, that we reserve the right to make a wasted cost order against him. So this was a very carefully drafted letter. I drafted the letter myself, and I put it there so that the population could be assured that if the action was pursued, and prematurely and ill-advisedly so, that we reserve the right to seek a wasted cost order against the attorney at law himself in this matter. News Day. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Hi, good morning. I'm glad you can hear me. And good morning to my colleagues. I have two questions. I'm going to ask one now and wait for the answer and then ask the second one. My first question, Minister of Health. Um, how does our case fatality rate and for the public, that's the number of deaths per confirmed cases, and it stands at 7% right now, how does that compare to regional and international numbers? Sure. And what role do you anticipate the prevalence of non-communicable diseases, such as you know diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, to play in terms of those figures? Sure. And in answering, can you also give the figure for the case fatality rate internationally? Okay. So the case fatality rate internationally averages out at somewhere of between 2 to 3% based on hundreds of thousands of deaths, in this case about 243,000 deaths, based on a case load of about 2 million. We have been saying from the very beginning, our statistics of 114 are too small. It is statistically insignificant to draw inferences from. You have said quite reasonably that you divide the number of cases by the number, number of deaths by the number of cases and you come up with 7%. All the international measures will tell you it is not that simple because our statistical base is too small to draw conclusions. What we do know is that our fatalities are being borne out by the international learning, which is most of the deaths will occur in the elderly with non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension. So that has been borne out. But until you have a wider number of caseloads as your denominator to divide your deaths by, 
It is not realistic or accurate at this point in time, based on a small number of cases, a small number of deaths, to say we have 7%. We have 7% statistically. But the international markers are, you must have, before you can make projections, at least 100 cases. We are not there yet because you have to take out the cruise ships. Uh, persons, we are at 62. And the international markers also tell you, you should have between 20 to 25 deaths before you could start to make those kinds of inferences. So it is too early to make those kinds of inferences because we just don't have enough data. So I hope that answers your question. You had another question? Sorry. Yes, I do have another question, but first I need to follow up on the question that was just answered by the minister, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I understand what you've said previously about these statistics. I do also understand that internationally, and if we look at the U.S. as an example, there have been concerns raised about the African-American population suffering disproportionately because of certain issues, including access to health, but also non-communicable diseases in that population. So but the second part of my question, which you have not answered yet, is how does that play into how the Ministry of Health is dealing with this, considering the prevalence of non-communicable diseases in the region? Okay. So on coming into office, it is this government that signed an IDB loan for about 50 million US dollars to tackle the vexing question of NCDs for the first time. We have had a robust campaign of getting people to stop drinking soft drinks. We banned the sale of soft drinks in schools. The last data I have is that the consumption of soft drinks in schools by school age children have gone down by 25%. The last data I have, which is about six months old, is that our accident and emergency admissions for repeat NCD issues have actually gone down by about 2%. Now, 2% does not sound like a big number, but 2% of 500 admissions is a big number. We have partnered with the Diabetes Association of Trinidad and Tobago we have ramped up our availability of NCD drugs via CDAP. We have done a whole plethora of activities across the country dealing with NCDs, inclusive of free screening for prostate cancer, thousands of people screened, um, uh, cervical cancer. And all of this is to deal with exactly what you have said, because it is based on a well-known, it's no longer a theory, it's a fact that the social determinants of health will tell you that the disadvantage in any society will always carry a disproportionate amount of healthcare burdens for a variety of socioeconomic reasons. And that is why we are targeting them. And finally, that is why we chose FEEL to give out masks, because masks given out by feel will reach the exact population that I think you and I want to reach. Those who are the most socio-economically disadvantaged, we want to reach them first with these free masks. So tackling NCDs is a governmental approach, which I have outlined. And the latest one now is to use feel to give out masks for their clientele who are in the disadvantaged communities of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. We go to uh, Guardian Media Limited. Hi, good, mo good morning, ministers. Peter Christopher from good Guardian Media. Good morning. Um, good morning. Um, I just wanted to know by chance if you all are aware that there are a series of roadblocks around the country at this point in time, and what might I, I don't know if you all have been in co in consultation with the police commissioner about it, but what might be causing that? And also a question to the AG concerning essential workers. Um, a lot of public servants and otherwise have been asking about the classification of essential workers because some of them believe that they are being called out to work even though they don't provide an essential service. So would there be any kind of review with regard to who qualifies as an essential worker? Thank you very much for the questions. Um, Roblox, yes. We have a very aggressive and active
Commissioner of Police and Minister of National Security and Prime Minister as Head of National Security Council and the AG is, of course, in constant communication with all entities. So roadblocks are a feature of policing. And in this time of uh, different management of population, the Commissioner of Police did say quite some time ago, expect roadblocks, expect um, activities such as this. I want to remind you, notwithstanding the very best efforts of Trinidad and Tobago, citizens as a whole, residents as a whole, there are people who are determined to continue with criminality. And therefore, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and the government have kept a very keen eye on activities. There are operations that are afoot on a constant basis. The Minister of National Security easily speaks to these matters on a constant basis. As he reported, he's in constant coordination on a daily basis with the Chief of Defense Staff and the Commissioner of Police. And the Commissioner of Police, as you know, speaks quite um, easily on this matter as well. So yes, it's a feature of COVID. Why is it going on? It's just general policing and we are intent on dealing with the scourge of criminality in this society at all measures. Whether we're in a pandemic or we're in regular society, we're going to be aggressive about it. Secondly, essential workers. So ministries are all essential workers and the public service, a large portion of the public service has been captured by that. What we did as a government is we administratively had each of the permanent secretaries or heads of division manage staff on a rotational basis. It obviously depends upon um, workload, people who have risks, uh, people who have responsibilities. So there's been a very fluid and flexible approach in the public service to this. It is important. Sometimes someone may not necessarily consider that they are an essential service, but uh, tell the person who has to receive a check at the end of the month for COVID relief um, that that check is not important and you'll find a different situation. So we don't expect that everybody's going to be happy about the rotation. We know that the public service is under constant watch. The Honorable Prime Minister has been very, very, very careful in monitoring us as ministers with responsibility for our respective portfolios on this um, dance. And we expect that perhaps we may not please everyone, but the show still has to go on. We have to have things running. At the AG's office, for instance, a death certificate is extremely important. You can't bury someone or cremate someone unless you have a death certificate. So business has to go on. We just ask people to hold on tight, continue to push ahead. We will get through this, and we've got to pull our fair share. Sometimes for some people it means a lot more work than normal, and for others it may involve a little less. Last thing I'll say, each of the ministries are working on measuring productivity in the remote environment. So we're being very careful that we can check the workflow on the work at home basis as we ensure that people are getting their dollars worth from paying us as public servants for what we do. Thank you, AG. Loop Titi. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to the good head morning, table. Nico. This good morning. is Loop Titi. Uh, I just had a question for both uh, the Minister of Health and uh, Mr. Alarawi. I'll start with you. Uh, the move concerning the prisoners, it's its a pretty drastic one. I'm, I'm thinking about their mental health. Uh, it's almost a sort of cultural shock that these people may go through because even the Trinidad and Tobago that we were two months ago is not what they're meeting now. Have we instituted anything like that, uh, you know, to publicly educate them a little bit more about what might be required as for social distancing and other things. And for the Minister of Health, we've seen an increase in traffic flow over the last couple of days, and it's coincided with the lessening of confirmed cases of COVID. Are you worried that Trinidad and Tobago is getting a little bit complacent these days? All right. AG? Yeah, oh, I, saw, I, saw, I, saw, <laughs> I saw a signal coming from Minister Cox, and, I, and I'm afraid of... Um, of, of collecting too hard clout on my head. <laughs> so sorry about that, folks. Um, thank you, Ms. Parsonal, for your question. Um, the, the prisoner management is not something that's new. I, I want to remind you that it was the Archbishop Harris who made the call for the government to consider persons who ought to be considered for release because if they got a conviction, they would have spent more time in jail than the conviction would have yielded. That's called maximum sentence. You've spent more time in maximum sentence. As Attorney General, you will know 
that in 2015, the first thing that I did was to hold a conference, a public forum on prisoners. Why? My methodology was we couldn't fix the criminal justice system until we measured it. And the immediate litmus test for that was in the prisons. So we've been paying attention to the prisons all along. We heeded the call of Archbishop Harris. It coincided with what the government was doing anyway. And we, in fact, released persons under maximum sentence indicator hearings, led by Justice Lucky in those days, who did approximately 400 of those hearings over the court-long vacation period. The psychological management of the patients is, uh, forgive me, of the prisoners, Prisoner. is a constant aspect of the prison's work. And in these bail hearings or in the mercy committee hearings that we're going to have in the days ahead of us, the psychological management is a very critical part of this. Some of these people are not in so much of a shock position. The guy who didn't pay his maintenance for one month and was given four months in prison. The person who has a traffic ticket that they didn't pay and they got in locked up. So some of these don't fit that criterion, but your point is well taken that there may be others who need to be educated as to the measures of COVID, social distancing, psychological impact, because it's a real equation. So I thank you for your question. It's part and parcel of the uh, deliberations of the government, and certainly it's underscored by your line of inquiry. Okay, Nika. So I will take your first part of the question, and I will tell you, you and I share the exact, exact same concern. Because at coming to the office and coming to this press conference this morning, there was actually a little bit of traffic jam by the lighthouse. And that is one of the measures I use. So you are spot on. I think the public should not even be contemplating raising any victory flag. We have won nothing. The virus is there waiting to strike the minute and the day we drop our guard. So you are absolutely spot on. The plateauing of cases does not mean that the virus is not lurking in anyone around us. As the chief medical officer has said, pretend everyone has it. I have to pretend the attorney general has it and Minister Cox on my right and left. Pretend that everyone has it. Keep on the measures. Keep on the measures. Keep on the social distancing. Because all the research tells you that once a country starts to retreat from these social distancing measures and hygiene measures too soon, you get your second wave and your third wave, which can be deadlier than the first wave. So, Nika, I really want to congratulate you on thinking correctly this morning. This is no time to raise any victory flag because we have won nothing. All we have done so far is keep the virus at bay. Remember, our borders are closed. Schools are out. If we didn't take those measures, who knows? Who knows? We'd have been talking about cases in the thousands. It is only because from the Prime Minister come down, we took robust measures that we are in this position. But this is no victory. This is not even close to a victory. Keep the pressure on. Um, I just got a, Minister Cox, if you'd permit me, I just got a, a, a virtual clout. <laughs> I could use that expression. Thank you to the member of public that said I failed to answer an important question. Yes, it's true. I, I regret that I did. Um, someone asked whether the public can attend court hearings in the virtual sitting, and the answer to that is yes. I noticed that, there, <laughs> I noticed that somebody was taking public victory over um, forcing the court into allowing them into the virtual hearings. That's not the case. The judiciary had always um, structured the virtual hearings to allow for members of the public to attend. In open court, you have that ability where anybody can sit in court once it's not in camera or closed court. So yes, you can attend at court virtually. That system was put into place. The registrar has confirmed that into writing. It was always part and parcel of this. And to the question asked about whether Tobago uh, and the virtual courts, I just want to remind that I've spoken to the virtual courts that we've created, the, the, the video conferencing facilities that we've created at the prisons. There'll be 12 courts by next week. We have several in operation right now. However, every judge has the ability to hold a virtual hearing, and we're doing that right now. So we use Microsoft Teams. 
We are dialed into virtual hearings. It's recorded by the FTR technology, the recording technology. At the same time that it's being recorded, we have transcriptionists sitting in their homes typing and transcribing the record. So that was purchased by the structure of the Chief Justice's measures of reform in conjunction with the government, and it was in planning. It was part of the legislation we passed, the bodies that we acquired, the people we put into work. So all of these virtual courts are up and running, but it started literally four years ago. Okay, AG, as you spoke about virtual courts, somebody wanted to know about the cost of it, if you were in a position to say what is the cost of the virtual courts. Yes, um, I got, and I thank the members of the judiciary that sent this message to me, I got a few details um, concerning this. Um, so, two of the containers were purchased for $70,000 each. So that's $70,000 per container. So we have an average cost of $70,000 per container. Again, I want to say thank you to Master Christian Morris Allen, the Executive Court Administrator, and to the Honorable Chief Justice, Mr. Ivor Archie, for pioneering how to do something as efficiently as possible. The government itself, at the AG's office, you know we've taken all of our services online. We have again done it at bare minimum cost. We've used in-house IT people at the Registrar General's office and the Team Judiciary's office. So we're really doing this at phenomenal prices, phenomenally low prices, but with high quality and careful recording as well. Thank you very much. Well, we are way past our time, and I know there are many questions out there to be answered. But we've come to the end of today's virtual media conference, and do remember that the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Communications are your only credible sources of government information on COVID-19. As we end another week, here is a reminder to follow public health guidelines in order to help Trinidad and Tobago win the war against this virus. And we want to appeal to you to take care of your health and protect others. We know it may be difficult at times, but there is enough evidence that these guidelines save lives. Please keep at it. We have come this far, but the end is not here. We need your cooperation in our fight against this deadly virus. Our number one priority is to come out of this pandemic alive. Please continue to help us. We are in this together. I am Donna Cox, Minister of Communications. Thank you for joining us today as the government continues its efforts to flatten the curve and beat COVID-19. Stay home. Stay safe. May God bless Trinidad and Tobago.